Thank you very much for uh, inviting me to come here. It's a great pleasure. And um, it's always difficult to go last because, you know, you have a great presentation before you and it's like, what else can I say? You know, I'll do my best. Um, there is, as you said, um, overlaps and stuff like that, so I will try to skip anything that's been covered before. Um, and feel free to stop me if you have questions as we go along as well. Good start. All right. Um, and I'm going to tell it from a, from a US perspective, so this is, doesn't necessarily apply to Spain as I, or other places, and especially listening to some of you um, the last couple of days about how variations are kind of newer here than now in the US and other, some other places. But it's a really big issue in North America and some other places where decisions are made on things like tenure, and tenure in the US is a very big deal. If you get tenure, it's like a lifetime membership for the most part, and you really only get fired if, for example, when you do something you know, unethical, illegal, or somehow your class is, um, you, you can't attract students anymore. Um, also, promotion, you know, the system associate for professor, um, as well as merit pay at the year, which is very competitive, and um, in, um, Higher education, as you know, is very different to a business model where, you know, if you do well in the business, you typically get some kind of reward. You know, if the profits go up, usually your profits like your salary will go up. But in um, higher education, it's not like that. So everyone's fighting for so few, so few, few amount of money, um, dollars, etc. And so it's very, very, um, so creating an instrument that's to measure teaching is very, very important because you could have, you know, you don't want to have a situation where teachers are really good, but it's not reflected by the evaluations and then they end up not getting the reward they deserve. Um, and, you know, at least in theory, it should help faculty members give information to improve their teaching. Okay? Everyone tell me at the back? Yeah. Everyone understand me? Yeah. 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 Okay. Um, so we talked about formative and summative. Um, so I won't say much more about that, where you use it ongoingly in a formative way, but the end, towards the end of your course. Um, <coughs> and it's an indicator of, of um, accountability in many institutions, like I said. Um, and the assumption, of course, is that the responses that we get from our students are both reliable and valid. So the question is, is that a good assumption? I can skip this now because both of them talked about this, and I didn't know about 1915. I, 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 you know, that's nice. Hundredth <laughs> year this year, and um, but in the 80s, pretty consistent what you had up there, um, where 80s was a really big period um, for you know research in that area. <coughs> All right, so um, it's it was in general the whole goal of it was to improve faculty teaching. It was formative. You know, you take what the students tell you, and then you make modifications to your teaching that will improve, you know, improve your teaching, improve their learning. But over the years, it's kind of transitioned into being, for some, punitive. I've seen some of my colleagues not get tenure, which means if you don't get tenure, you have to leave, usually within the year, because of their teaching. Because they're teaching, not teaching, because of their teaching evaluations. Yet no one has ever seen them teach other than the students, and you rely on oftentimes numbers to determine somebody's fate, which, you know, that's scary. Um, <coughs> so rating, um, you know, rating are used usually um, different type skills or rating scales, um, and the decisions that I said I made based on them. Um, so, as has been eloquently shown today, if, if, you have, if you have a, you know, uh, a teaching instrument um, that is well designed, has the psychometric properties, then it could be, of course, a useful indicator. Um, but the question is, you know, what does it take to have an instrument, to design an instrument that has uh, psychometric properties? Okay. Um, that's a question that's still out there. <coughs> um, and so the teaching instruments are predominantly quantitative, okay? In some places, exclusively quantitative. Even institutions that have an open-ended system 
they often ignored or they don't play any role whatsoever. And there's somebody in my field who's a big mixed methods person who believes in the power of both quantitative and qualitative, that concerns me a lot. That we have this rich qualitative data that we get from our students, the ones who complete it. Now one of you said you don't complete the box, was it you that said you don't yeah. complete the box? But you know, I was, you know that's, that's um, for those who do, that's, that's throwing away good, good information when we don't uh, factor it in. Um, so, um, it's the numbers that I said that are given the most weight, and yet, grain inflation, both um, doctors here have mentioned that, and, um, but it may not be optimal um, to help improve teaching as well, which is another issue. <coughs> so it's very much subject to abuse and, and misuse, and there are some information that you need to be able to interpret them adequately. You know those statistics courses you've taken or the measurement courses you've taken that some of our administrators have not taken or a long time ago they took them? <laughs> well, it could, um, you know, it could be really, really um, problematic if, for example, you don't know the, the concepts of constant intervals and point estimates being, you know, um, a 4.9 on the 5-point scale versus a 4.8 that to be able to say the 4.9 is better than the 4.8 is not, you know, based on standard deviation is not uh, an accurate statement. Um, and so, um, let me skip that slide there. Um, there are some limitations, quite a few limitations, um, some of which are fixable, some of which um, are more challenging. Um, so administration procedures, that's fixable. Um, so you have, you know, instructions given, if you give instructions, time them when you do it. Um, so if you, for example, give an instrument, uh, ask students to fill it in just before they take an examination, or just before, before they turn in their last project, that might not be a good time. Um, and there's, um, we really talked about it being the only indicator, using it the only indicator is problematic. Um, then you have uh, the fact that you hear some people say, oh, you know, we'll compare to other people in the department, not, and yet overlook the fact that 50% are always going to appear below the median. I mean, it's a basic fact, but sometimes you hear people interpreting it as if that's, you know, everybody should go above the median somehow, which would be great. Uh, reliability and validity are two components, at least in the classical test theory world, and we haven't even mentioned item response theory, that's another talk. But today we're going to talk about classical, we're talk about classical test theory. Um, and so, you know, um, many studies do show that uh, you have high score, score reliability. It was interesting to see you have, what, 0.6 to 0.8? Anyone? One of you actually, 0.6 to 0.8 um, across time. Um, but you have some, even with that, you have some assumptions. Um, you, I don't know if you've taken the measure of you may have heard the concept of tower equivalence. Don't worry if you haven't. But the fact that um, that's hard to get anyway in many contexts, particularly hard in teaching, where you've got different behaviors that could be very different. So if you try to measure it on a common scale, common metric, it's going to be a problem. <coughs> um, you've got multiple sources of the measurement error. Um, and some of them are quite difficult to identify, although you know, the, the body of research is getting starting to identify more and more sources of the error. Um, they're separate and it's cumulative, and there's interaction effects. Um, and so um, the same student might rate the same, you know, the same professor differently at different times. Okay? Um, so coefficient alpha, even the use of that could be problematic. Okay? So something for us to think about as those who design tests. Um, but even if you know, we can show that, first of all, score reliability is a good indicator for um, instruments of teacher effectiveness. And on top of that, it yields you know, reliable scores. Um, it still doesn't mean, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's valid, okay? You think of the idea that you could, you know, you could throw, if you have a dartboard, for example, I like to use, you throw three darts at the dartboard, and you, you never get the center, you always get the, ed the edge, or three of your darts hit the edge, you've got reliability, but you haven't got validity. Okay? 
So um, this is the model you refer to, the meta-validation model, um, where you look at using Messick, it's a really big name in the field that you might have heard of, that's a great work on validity. Um, if that's interest in yours, you when you're familiar with Messick, it's, it's, I would recommend you read um, his work. And um, from there, kind of broke down um, the idea, the concept of validity is not being, you know, even though it's a unitary concept, it has, it has aspects, it has dimensions within it. And you may have heard of the, the three major C's, criterion, content, and constructs related to validity. And each of those have their own, um, you know, types. Are you familiar with this? Yeah. Okay, good. Um, <coughs> so I can skip onto here, and that's what it might look like. So from there, and this is, you know, having used some of the more, more recent ones that you have done, but you, said, you did say that you had some similarities. So concurrent predictive is, is strong in the literature. Okay, so you look at the literature and you find that typically um, high scores in teacher evaluations predict things quite well, both in the, in the future, I predict it, and concurrently. Um, <coughs> and then you have face validity, you know, those who design it well, uh, which might have some, you know, it looks like a test, it has the components of a, of a test, it has, it has a item that are, you know, not too distracting and so forth. But much of the other evidence is either inadequate or weak. Um, a big one, or big two there, are the item and sample validity. So in the item one, I've seen test item, I keep saying test item, I've seen um, evaluation items <coughs> like uh, the, professor, uh, the textbook was really good, okay? Those who teach quantitative methods, what's the chances that someone who's not in that field is going to say the textbook was really enjoyable? Okay? And does that mean I'm a bad teacher? Because if I've chosen a classic textbook that many people in the community agree is a good textbook, but the, teacher, but the students have to find it boring or not like it, does that mean I'm a bad teacher? Okay, you could question that. Um, we were talking in the car about, um, there's a question that's often asked of the the professor, the instructor, is knowledgeable. Well, for some courses that might be okay. But again, some of these more complex courses that students find more complex, like quantitative methods, you know, or higher level courses, I was questioning whether the students, how would they know that? Just as you show in that Dr. Fox demonstration, you can, I can stand up here and, you know, use a few fancy terms and look as if I know what I'm talking about, like I'm doing now, but end up not knowing. And the students say, oh, he really knows a lot. Okay? So that's really, really um, a problematic item. I've had people talk about um, speaking good English. That is a problematic item. In fact, one of my colleagues, Collins, you saw her name there earlier, she gets rated badly because she is from the north. She has a New York accent, teaches in the south, Arkansas. Might not mean to think as much to you. You've not been there, but the accents are so different. And she gets penalized because of that. They'll say, oh, she, she, you know, her accent is not good. And so, again, does that mean she's a bad teacher? As long as she's understandable, it doesn't matter what accent you have. Um, <coughs> so those examples there of either item deletion and sampling, does it, you know, does it cover the whole domain? And this is something we need to work on. It's, we have, can someone tell me their favorite theory in psychology? <coughs> Any theory comes to your head? Don't be shy. Tell me a psychological theory. So you've been so quiet, I'm not letting you guys off the hook. <laughs> so tell me a psychological theory that comes to your head. It's hundreds of them. <laughs> the shy? Maybe terror management theory? Sorry? Terror management theory? Okay, I don't even know what that is. So what can you explain to me what that is? Really briefly? Yes. Um, it is whenever you threaten people mm -hmm. with death. Mm -hmm. Or when you remind them of their own death, then um, they typically um, hold on to their principles and be really conservative okay. if you ask them about political change or whatever. Okay, is that well established? Uh, Did you say? Yeah. Okay. Sometimes. Excellent. Any others? Good. Thank you. I learned something today. You see? Swap places later. Yeah. Any, any others? Come on, some of the classic psychological theories. I'm sorry? Conductism. Okay. Can you explain what that is, please? Uh, that's uh, basically that uh, we 
enforcement uh, and punishments and things associated with our uh, conduct uh, determine them. Okay. Is that well established? I'd say so. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so we have, you know, some of the foods I think some of you would say, I mean, like on your banjo and and those kind of theories out there, Vygotsky, and, and so many theories, psycho psychology theories, educational theories, but there are lots out there, and, and a lot of them have stood the test of time. So why can't we come up with some a teaching theory? Which I, has always baffled me, um, because as you know, without a theory, it's very difficult to create instruments that across, at least across the institution, if not, if not beyond. So it's something we need to kind of really try to work out. I don't know if you have an answer for that. I'm interested in the area because you're very familiar with this more than I am. But I'm interested to see why that's the case, why it's not the case. Um, so, um, <coughs> talked about small variations. That happens a lot with point estimates. You're not reflecting the fact that it might be just a chance difference. Um, and then, as I said, um, items that are, you know, you can't answer adequately, like knowledge of the professor or don't provide good information, like English, <coughs> um, or Spanish, whatever the, the, the context of the country is. Um, then you have a non-response bias. Um, not everyone responds to every item. And we don't really do much about that, for the most part. Um, so we have that missing data problem going on, that we leave out, and then not everyone in the class um, responding. And that's one of the recommendations I think both of you had about making it clear to the students the importance of the evaluation. Because a lot of students, if they don't know the importance of where it's going to go, you don't get a chance to get any feedback from it, and you're probably less motivated to complete it. Especially if you are, not really, maybe if you're at the end, you thought the class was great, or they thought the class was bad, you might be more motivated, motivated to do it because you want to express yourself, but those in the middle, often you're going to just say, you know what, I'm not going to say anything. Which is unfortunate. <coughs> um, because you could probably learn more from those in the middle than from the extremes that have a good way of teaching. <coughs> All right, so um, then you've got this idea of not taking into account the demographic profile. And the study I'll briefly talk about in a few minutes, you know, we kind of sh showed, as, a, as, as other studies, that demographic profile of your students can make a huge difference. And this is what you pointed out earlier. Um, so in one of our studies, we looked at, um, we had a pretty big sample size, nearly a thousand students. And uh, our issue was, you know, most instruments that we know of are top down, which means the administrators design the instruments because they believe they know what teach, good teaching is, what it looks like, and what should be assessed. And there's very few that starts from the bottom up, which is from the student upwards, and the students are our stakeholders. They're the ones taking the courses, they should have a say I believe in you know what makes good teaching. So we, as a few other studies have done, looked at it qualitatively, start qualitatively, and asked them, you know, um, college students, undergraduate, masters, doctor students <coughs> in one institution, what they think are characteristics of effective teachers. Okay, and from there, you know, they they specify some maybe you know on average they gave three to four characteristics, <coughs> and from there. We um, use qualitative analysis to come up with themes, and then from the themes we use qualitative analysis to, you know, including things like a factor analysis and then things like a motivator analysis to, to, to examine relationships between the themes and the demographic profile. And you can see here that there were many of the demographic variables were related to the themes that came out. Okay, in fact, there were nine themes. So for example, one of the themes, which is the most common theme, and it's been replicated in several studies I've done over the years by co-authors, is student-centeredness. I don't know if it's the same in Spain, but in the US it seems student-centeredness is really an important factor. So if you're a professor who's not very student-centered, you might suffer in your evaluations. And what we found also, females were much more likely okay, to say that was important than males. Okay? People of color were more likely to talk about discipline than white students. Um, so, you know, so you had different, different uh, findings that came from that, which showed that um, based on your profile, so a lot of my classes um, are all female, because I teach in education, 
and oftentimes I might teach literacy or leadership, etc. So I often may used to having classes where 90%, 95%, sometimes 100% are female. So if I'm not student-centered, but effective in other ways, should I be penalized because of that? That's a question of debate, but there are ways that we can adjust, as you know, for that profile, but oftentimes we don't do that. <coughs> so, um, and then in this same, and you mentioned it, uh, sorry, let's repeat it again, this same institution, there are several um, themes that emerged from the qualitative responses that tacked um, uh, constructs that weren't even mentioned in the, in the scale that they were using. So, for example, there was nothing on student centeredness, any items on that. Okay? And so, um, that's also a problem when we're not um, taking into account what our stakeholders, our students think are the most important characteristics. Okay? Um, even if you do have an optimal, you can design an instrument that's not optimal, that is optimal, and it doesn't guarantee the interpretations are going to be optimal. So, um, again, I'm not taking into account extraneous variables, like whether it's required versus elective, whether it's, you know, different levels of, of complexity. Um, and then, that between this within, again, the most commonsensical to me way of using these evaluations for within instructor comparisons. So, looking at you over time, looking at your development, is much more informative and um, has a better chance of improving your, your teaching than between when you compare me to somebody else. Um, that could be demotivational, especially if you think it's unfair um, how that, you take, that you come out lower down your person, you people you're competing you're compared with. Okay, so let's put that slide there. Um, not factoring in, and this has been said by all three of us now, common intervals, effect sizes, and so forth. Also, um, just basic statistical uh, concepts which get omitted when it comes to evaluation, which is amazing, really it's scary. Missing data I've talked about already. Um, I think we reported, uh, there's actually about three or four court rulings in um, the US where the faculty took the university to court and the attorney just said, oh, what's your score reliability? And when the, when the school said, oh, we don't know it, that was it. Now you have to settle. Because if you can't show your instrument has good psychometric properties, and somebody's suing you, that's, 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 that's uh, candy for, uh, for an attorney. Um, candy, I'm sure I said chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> so, so faith to turn into account of indices. We talked about qualitative <coughs> information. And there's so many of them you can have. Course material, self-evaluation, documented peer assessment. Um, and uh, there'll be others in, a, in, a, in another slide to come. Um, and um, they should be, all those students in our, in our class should be expected to assess what they learned explicitly in the course. And as I said, that's why it's important to get their feedback on what they think is important. Um, and you see some other things there, which um, ethics and rapport and so forth. Okay. Um, and Items should be um, look at specific behavior. So we need to find out what do teachers who are effective do, and then how can we how can we assess that? Okay. Um, how many items do we need to assess each of those behaviors? <coughs> and I love your idea of the um, of the um, taxonomy. Um, the that's that's very novel. You should. I love you published that anyway. But that's you have. Um, yeah, that's. I need to get hold of that. Because that's very creative and. Good use of uh, theory, and uh, if it's for so forty purposes, then of course it should be given early on in the semester. I know you had some concerns about forty versus summative earlier. Um, for summative, of course, it should be towards the end, but it should not be at a time where it's necessarily high stress, the high stress period, like just before the examination. Um, where possible, if you have in the U.S., typically, well, at least from what I know, you're not supposed to be in the room when you are as the instructor when you're there. So you might have a student who comes in, part of the class, or somebody from your own student, um, graduate assistant who, you know, administers a survey and then if you give that person a script, it's a good way to standardize it, tell them exactly what they should do, the, the instructions, um, and um, 
So it should be informed what's going to happen with the ratings. Um, and um, let's see what else. Um, score liability, we talked about that. So these are some um, quotes from Field and Franklin. I'll just say, hit some of them. Uh, present clear information about the evaluation criteria. Um, educate the use of the ratings to avoid misuse and abuse. Um, um, include resources for improvement. Uh, I know you, you talked about that. Some, some schools. I don't think our school has that to my knowledge. Is mm -hmm. yeah. Adhere to rigorous psychometric and measurement principles. Um, and be defensible in as much as you can. Um, but this open-endedness is really, really important. So when you, when you include that, and some of these um, are very useful, some are more useful than others, to accompany your teaching. Um, there's some, some debates as to whether somebody from your faculty should come into your classroom and observe you teach, in addition to your, to your, you know, your rating score. <coughs> um, there's pros and cons of that, of course. Um, if that's the case, it's probably better if it's a peer than it is somebody of higher ranking, because that could have all kinds of power dynamics going on. Um, then you have, you know, issues of should it be videotaped, which keep those as part of your portfolio. Um, but there are many ways that you can support your teaching beyond the, the score, the one score. Um, so, um, Data driven, this is a big thing, and, and, and I don't know if you have an instrument in this, you know, one that's validated in this um, institution of yours, but if you're working on it, um, it's something that takes time. It's not something you could rush, sit down and write a few items and then give it out. It's something that does take time, months, if not longer, to have one that's really good, especially bearing in mind that it's going to be used to make some important decisions. Um, and so, um, this idea of including the stakeholders, I, I like that, as I said, being the students. Um, and um, give that. So when you include the different, go beyond just the numbers, it opens it up to what, I, what we call mixed methods or mixed, mixed methodology, which is my, one of my passions. Um, using both quantitative and qualitative, collecting both quantitative and qualitative data, analyzing it, interpreting it within the same framework. Now, going beyond that, if we think about it, um, we could use what's called impact evaluation. Okay, because what you're doing, you're teaching, you're bringing something into the setting, okay, and then you want to assess that intervention, which is you as a te your teaching, and the, the effect it had on something of interest like learning, etc. Okay, so <clears throat> for the rest of this presentation, I'm just going to talk a little bit about impact evaluation. So this is a, this is the model that we um, that we are developing. <coughs> so it's actually in press right now <coughs> in a um, publication. And um, essentially, our definition of what we call the mixed method theory-based impact evaluation, the hits on the high points, is rigorous, systematic, uses quantitative and qualitative information, okay, and it's collaborative. So it's not just the uh, hierarchy making the high terms into a collaboration. Um, and it's measuring um, long-term changes as well as, as, well as short-term, positive and negative or unintended consequences in the lives, in this case, of students. <coughs> Academic life, education lives, okay? So qualitative and quantitative viewpoints are the essence of it, as well as <coughs> the kind of theory that drives it. Um, there are six broad rationales for this impact evaluation, and that's um, enrichment, let's put it in the next slide, oh, enrichment, um, significance enhancement, um, treatment. The one that um, pertains to teaching evaluations is instrument fidelity, so because you're going to look to make sure that the instrument does what it's supposed to, that you want it to do. Okay. There's like an eight phase um, better framework. So first of all, you've got to understand the context, so the context of teaching. And every institution has a different context, certainly every country has a different context. So anything that you've developed, for example, doesn't necessarily, in Belgium, doesn't necessarily relate to what, what's in Spain, what the value system is in Spain for teaching. So understanding the, the context, the construct, and then the, the causal chain, which is, goes from the teaching 
to their learning outcomes or, or anything else of interest that you want. Um, then collect the data, um, determine the type, the level of giant's ability, does it just pertain to your class or does it go beyond your class to other classes within the institution or beyond? Conduct a rigorous evaluation of the impact and then the process analysis, the process involved in, <coughs> in the evaluation, then the meta evaluation of the process and the product. Okay. So it talks about instrument fidelity for there, that's what that's the rationale. So within that, you have um, you have different phases of an instrument development, of course. You know, beginning phase and then you monitor as you go along and then you, you continue. This is this is another article that we had published, my colleagues and I, in Joel Mixed Method Research, where we developed phases for developing an instrument using mixed method techniques. Okay? A lot of time, development of a qualitative instrument is seen as a quantitative um, enterprise, but I would argue it's mixed methods and it's optimum. Because at some point, let's say you wanted to develop a scale measure of intelligence, okay? and you get a score, you have your IQ scores. Well, that might seem as quantitative, but at some point in the beginning, you need to know what intelligence looks like, don't we? And how do you get that? Okay? You don't get that from quantitative. You have to observe, and, and again, that's going to be cultural, culturally specific and context specific, it's going to vary. Um, for example, um, they say because we have a doctorate that we're supposed to be intelligent. I question that sometimes. I question that a lot of times with me, anyway. So, for example, I'm very bad with cars, okay? Very bad with cars. So when I'm driving my car and there's a noise, what do I do? I turn the radio up. <laughs> and it's like, hey, if, it's, if it goes wrong, you know, um, that's life, and I'm going to call whoever. And it's just to change the time. In fact, when I put petrol or gas in my car, I thought I've really accomplished something. I thought I've done something really impressive. You know, for all of you, it's like, you know, so easy. But for me, that's quite impressive. So, so and yet, many intelligence tests doesn't measure you know, if, to be a car mechanic these days, it's, you've got to be pretty smart because the, the computer systems in cars now are very impressive compared to, you know, when I was a child, where I was able to open the car. Just to, just to be able to, just the locking system is, 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 is impressive. So, <coughs> and yet, we won't necessarily consider the mechanic as being intelligent, and yet they display a lot of skills. So, in the, but in that context, I would say they're very intelligent, okay? So looking at that, um, looking at, uh, you know, Sternberg talks about practical intelligence versus your old-fashioned cognitive intelligence. Um, so these are just steps you can go that you, um, as you're developing your instrument, um, of course, developing it once you've, you know, understood the context, and you can do all kinds of different things. So you could do it from qualitative, uh, straightforward qualitative interviews, focus groups, to uh, Delphi technique, where you've got experts, where you, you know, the experts have to tell you what's like the study you talked about, the, the award winning teachers, maybe you get them together and say, you know, what, um, what makes, um, you know, what makes good teachers or what made you, you as a good teacher or techniques we have never seen used in this context, Q methodology, something I'm trying to promote now, um, where you have to understand the, you know, you, you do the fact analysis, what's called a Q fact analysis, where you factor in the, the, uh, the items in this case instead of the, the people. Um, so any of those things play into your initial development. Once you developed it, you go on from there and you full test it. Okay? Now some people stop there, full test it, oh it looks okay, bang, let's, let's, let's use it. But to go further, after the full test you redesign it um, and then you validate it using the revised instrument. Uh, there's a qualitative phase, so that will be a traditional factor analysis and score reliability and so forth that you look at. But also qualitatively, so for example, when you, are, when you have items, I like, argue this for any quantitative instrument you do, when you're developing that instrument and you give it out as a field test, you ask them to critique each item, okay? Each item as you go along. Also, then you say, is there anything that's been left out that you think that's not there among the items that you completed? And so that gives you your qualitative information for that phase, um, phase seven there that you analyze. And when we've done this for real, um, in fact, in the article we had an example where we had an instrument that qualitatively seemed to be really good, had really high, had two factors for the score factor analysis, but for score like you coefficient with the point, I think 0 0.96, 0 0.94, if you didn't have the qualitative, you said this is a great instrument, let's go. But the qualitative 
showed us that there were three important domains or themes missing from that instrument. So it had low contact availability, low sample availability that we could only get from our stakeholders. I hope that makes sense. And so, so adding that qualitative piece is really important. Um, and so that, that yields a, what we call the mixed method or mixed analysis, and then you go from there. So um, <coughs> as part of doing this, um, this was actually this came out quite nicely. Um, in just one study, one institution, I'm not generalizing to any other institution, but at that institution, there were nine things that came out. And it's nice because they came out to respect it. So responsive, enthusiastic student centers, and so forth that were considered from the students to be really important. Um, and then after factor analysis, yes, you have factor analysis theme, factor analysis themes, um, as long as you have the, you know, the basic requirements that you need, like sample size, adequacy, and so forth. Um, then you have communicator, advocate, responsible, and empower, empowering, which spells out to care, the first four letters. So we have respected and care, so based on that, we are, you know, developing this respected and care model um, from there, uh, which are purple words. Then we did a follow-up study where we looked <coughs> only at doctoral students. We wanted to say, okay, the doctoral students have a similar, what they deem to be important is that similar. And it was in terms of the themes. In fact, that was replicated, which is nice, except you have a, you know, a couple of them that were higher or lower than for the... Uh, so the one on the right is the doctor students, one on the left is the original way, it was the whole, um, the whole university um, sample. And, but in the fact analysis, it actually ended up having four meta themes that came up. There was three. So you had synergist, enthusiast, and transformer, so we spelled that to set. And so, um, expect to set. So in that case, it's showing that I'm not sure it's a good idea to have a one-size-fits-all mentality. Institution, that i.e. to have one instrument that you give to every student regardless of the class, regardless of the course, regardless of the subject, regardless of the year of study, and all of those factors. And now we get into online learning, which has different, you know, someone who does both now, um, different skills, different expectations. <coughs> um, anyone here ever taught online, taught virtually? Okay. See, it's very different, isn't it? Students want immediate feedback as soon as possible. If you don't, even when I'm out of town, that's why I always like to have my to make sure I'm, I'm connected. If I don't give immediate feedback within 24 hours, they start to panic. And, and versus, you know, my face-to-face -face class, that I have them every Wednesday, if I have them tomorrow night when I get back, you know, I can say, to, they, know I'm, they know I'm here, so they know, okay, just be patient, you know. I have a question, they can wait until next week. Um, or if they send an email, they know I'm not necessarily going to respond straight away. So, um, so that's very different. Um, very different population, which, so if it's a different population, does it make sense to give the same instrument? Well, if it does, then we have to go to global instruments then that cover both. Because if you go specific, I would argue that you're going to have um, situations where some of the items don't fit. Um, <coughs> so that needs to be looked at. I think we could have a very big role. I did mention briefly um, um, about um, item response theory, but that's. Um, we could do some things that we do in the cognitive world, ice response theory, where we use one parameter, two parameter, three parameter, etc., and go from there to look at things like uh, differential item functioning, the effect of that, and look and see if we have bias. For example, if you wanted to compare um, classes that are taught virtually versus classes face to face, you know, for the same instrument, um, are we going to get any kind of bias going on? So these are some of these being done with more of the classical test theory approach as opposed to ice response theory. Um, so, um, this is what I'm working on. We're working on right now in the validation set. We're doing one now based on the finding, we're doing one for um, undergraduate masters and the other one for doctorate students. Um, so it's a longish process because I want to try and make sure it's useful to that university. So, I'm going to stop there. I look forward to your questions for me or for the other two who are so much better than me, and sorry I don't have any chocolate, but... <laughs>